hopefully everyone can hear me for this strength conditioning live q and I'll try and get some of your questions. So one of the questions that's come in from Atomics Football is that he's training on a regular basis, but for some reason he's not feeling fresh when he plays. Um, what could be the reason? Well, if you're training regularly, um, you could potentially be training too much or at least too soon and causing too much fatigue right before a game. So I can't be sure on what the reason why you're not feeling fresh, but they're the two things that I would look for straight away. So are you training six or seven days a week and not having any days of complete rest or even lighter days? Or are you planning on a Saturday and you're having a big session on a Friday, which is going to be another reason why you might not be feeling fresh. So they're the two things I'd look at. And if you don't think you're training that often, you're only training three or four times a week and you're not training the day before a match or two days before a match and it's really intense, then you're going to have to look at some other things and things such as recovery. So using passive methods of recovery and good nutrition and good sleep. So if it's not those two things I mentioned, it's going to be some of these extra things like nutrition and sleep and recovery that's really going to affect your performance. So they're definitely the things to, to address. Okay, so we got some more people joining us and some more questions coming in. So we got a question coming in asking, what's the best plyometric, plyometric exercise for a footballer to do before a gym session? Um, so I wouldn't really say there's a best exercise in general and definitely not a best exercise to do before a gym session. Um, I'd agree that before a gym session or before a resistance training session, it's probably a good idea to do some plyometric training. So off the back of your dynamic warm up, um, you're going to be warm up and warmed up and ready to go, but you're also not going to be fatigued. You're going to have the ability to produce high, amount, high amounts of power um, and be really reactive then that is a good time to do plyometric exercises. Um, and any plyometric exercises that you might do in any other setting is also going to be a good idea to do before a gym session. So plyometric exercises always go from kind of a continuum of simple to more complex, um, from lower intensity to higher intensity. And that means that it should be simple exercises like skipping could be a really good low intensity um, plyometric exercise you can do. So you can ensure you've got good coordination in that. And then you can start to progress to things like reactive hurdle jumps with two legs. And then you can progress to either more intense exercises once you're better at them or single leg plyometric exercises, which can be very, very intense and can also be very good at trying to replicate some of the ground reaction forces that we get in games. So it's really tough to replicate um, two or three or four times body weight through the ankle and the calf which your body might get when it's running. And um, so it's really tough to replicate those forces in the gym when you might only be able to do calf raises with your body weight or some small additional loads. So plyometrics are a really good way of A, producing a lot of power and B, um, bridging the gap from some of the things we do on the pitch to being able to load those things and do them in the gym and therefore making us more resilient. So hopefully that answered your question. And um, we can look at what else is coming in. So for those that are joining us, we won't be looking at any nutrition questions or anything like that. Um, nutrition was dealt with yesterday, just in case you were wondering. Okay, so a follow-up from Atomic Football. Um, or this might be a slightly different, different question, actually, to the original one, is how do you know your sessions have been helpful for you as a player and how you can assess your performance? So if you do have um, any of our programs... Um, or you have been involved in any kind of strength and conditioning program in general, they usually have some type of testing parameters. Okay, so there might be a strength test, there might be a speed test, there might be an agility test or a change of direction test. Um, there might be some tests for lower body power, like some jump testing, whether that's counter movement jump, whether it's a test of reactive strength index. Um, so any testing is going to be done at the beginning, usually in the middle and at the end. So in a football season, you might test at the start of preseason, at the end of preseason, and so just the start of the season. Then you might test in the middle of the season and at the end of the season. So testing is a good way to see if your sessions are having an actual kind of impact on your physical, um, your physical performance. 
hopefully those tests are going to be reliable, which means if you do the same test three times, the score should be very close to the same score each three times. And hopefully they should be valid tests as well, which means that being good at the test, it means you're probably going to be good at the sport. There's no point testing something that if you're good at it, it's not going to have any impact on your ability to be good at the sport at all. So some simple tests that you can do on your own. Um, you can do a broad jump test using a measuring tape. So that's going to be a really reliable test and it's probably going to be a half decent predictor of acceleration uh, performance. Um, so that's a simple one you can do. You can do a counter movement jump test at home using an app called My Jump or a simple way you can do it as well. If you've got some chalk and a wall you don't mind marking, it's, you can stand next to a wall with your arm extended into the air as high as you can. And if you rub some chalk on your hand and rub it on the wall as high as you can while standing still, then you have how tall you are with a reach. Then you can jump and try and mark the, the wall as high as you can. And if you measure the distance between the two chalk marks, so your standing mark and then your jumping mark, then you're going to have a rough indicator of your jump height. So jump height has been found to correlate with um, acceleration and maximal sprint speed. Um, and it generally is a, a, a measure that people use um, to predict lower body power or as, as a measure of lower body power. So you've got two jump tests there. Um, any speed test can be done um, ideally using timing gates. Timing gates are becoming more affordable, but are still not something that is um, that is readily available to individuals. Um, if you're willing to go out and spend um, a thousand or two thousand pounds, you might be able to get some of the um, more affordable timing gates on the market. Um, if not, you can do some sprint tests um, using things like an iPhone and a stopwatch, and you can. It's not ideal, but it might give you some small measure of your speed and some rough idea. Um, it, although it's not perfect, Usain Bolt is going to get a much better score than me if you record it with timing gates with a stopwatch. So it's going to give you a rough idea on if your if your speed is improving. So there are just some really simple tests on um, on more dynamic, um, dynamic and powerful tests. Then you can also do strength tests using either one um, RM testing for things like. Uh, back squat or deadlift, whether it be a trap bar deadlift or conventional for lower body strength. So probably pick one of those exercises. You might pick an upper body strength exercise like chin ups or even bench press. So there's a lot of different testing that you can do at home that can be fairly valid and reliable to a degree. So for an individual who's training, it doesn't need to be um, absolutely 100% perfect, the same way it would need to be for a scientific study or a dissertation. But if it's just something that's going to give you a rough idea on how you're improving and if your program is working, then it's probably a good idea to do some of those testing. So we've got a question from Emmanuel coming in on our Facebook community page. Um, how important is acceleration? Um, acceleration and the, its importance probably, um, I can't describe how important it is. It's that important essentially. So acceleration is really crucial. Um, the vast majority of sprints in football are less than 30 meters. So I'm not sure what the exact percentage on that, but I think it's something like under 85% um, of sprints in football are under 29 meters or 30 meters. So what we're looking at is acceleration makes up most of our, most of our activity on the pitch when we're involved in some movements that involve the ball. So obviously there's a, there's a lot of kind of quieter time in football. If you, you're not near the ball, you're not involved. But if you need to get to, to the ball or you need to get to an opponent opponent or a player you're, you're going to be marking, you most likely have to accelerate towards that player. So a lot of the actions that involve you and the ball and the moments that kind of decide games and decide whether you win or lose are going to involve acceleration. So acceleration is probably one of the number of one things that you should be practicing more so than top speed, more so than strength and power even, because acceleration needs to be looked at not just as a physical activity, it needs to be looked at as a skill that needs to be practiced. So I'm not saying go out and practice sprinting short distances again and again and again in a straight line in the same way. Um, in a game, you're going to initiate those accelerations from different positions. So you might initiate them from moving sideways. You might be moving backwards. Um, it's not likely you're going to be in a static position. But once you've learned 
how to accelerate and you feel like you're fairly competent accelerating in short distances, so less than 20 or 30 meters, and you can do that from a static, say a two point start, once you've mastered that and you've learned the rules, then you can go out and you can start to break the rules of those those movements a little bit. You can initiate from them from different positions. Um, you might include a ball, you might include an opponent, and you might make those accelerations competitive and reactive in order to keep developing, keep uh, developing the skills that you're gonna need in the game. Um, so acceleration, crucially important. I've mentioned a couple of ways that you can develop that skill, but yeah, it's definitely something you need to be doing on a regular basis, at least on a weekly basis. Okay, let's have a look at what else is coming in on the Instagram page. Is high intensity interval training just effective as distance running to build up fitness? So high, in high intensity interval training is gonna be much better than um, distance running and long slow distance training, which is, an article that's actually been addressed on our blog. So you can have a look there if you want more detail to what I go into today. But if you go into professional clubs up and down the country, you're gonna find that you're gonna see very little, if any, long slow distance running being done in football. So I think it's been it's been long known from research and when you when you look at the game um in a kind of critical way rather than just the way it's always been done when you try and think about all aspects of it, yes, a game is 90 minutes, but a football match is made up of really high intensity actions interspersed with many, many periods of low intensity actions. So if you look at how long the ball's actually in play, you're probably looking at no more than around 50 or 51 minutes. And if you look at an individual's time with the ball, for example, depending on the position, it could be at or underneath one minute. So it's really high intensity actions from different individuals during a football match in, in different kind of patterns that decide who wins or loses. So there's probably not much point going out and doing lots of long slow distance running with no changes of direction, no changes in intensity, because that absolutely does not mirror the game. Um, and it also doesn't mirror or reflect the energy systems that are used in really important moments in the game. So I would say that high intensity interval training is far more useful at developing football specific kind of stamina or endurance or whatever it is you want to call it and than long slow distance running. So I would definitely make sure that you're probably not just hitting the pavement and kind of logging in lots of miles um, because that's something that can actually cause you injuries and be really high impact when you're probably not going to get that much more out of it. So I hope that helps. We'll see what else is coming in. Okay, Shivam has asked a good question um, and a question that a lot of people will ask, how to gain weight um, alongside all the kind of cardio and the football training um, whilst that, that is involved in playing football, in, whether that's in football training or whether that's in kind of extra work that you're doing um, to increase your kind of stamina and your ability to last 90 minutes on the pitch. So gaining weight should be the simplest thing in the world. It's um, I'm quickly going to mention nutrition, um, even though that's not going to be my specific area. You need to be in a calorie surplus, so you need to make sure you're consuming more calories than you you um, you burn and that you use in your everyday life and in your various training and practices. Um, so that's the first box you need to tick. Um, the second thing you need to do, if you are a player that um, needs to put on weight and you're definitely not going to be able to perform at the same level, and in the same way, if you're, you don't put on weight, so when we're talking about weight, generally we're talking about muscle. We want to um, produce hypertrophy and increase muscle size, whether that's going to be to hold off a player or whether that's going to be to stand your ground in certain situations, if that's something you need to do, then you definitely need to make sure that you are A, training for hypertrophy, um, so that's going to be higher rep work, so in the 8 to 15 rep range, um, and you're going to need to be doing multiple sets as well. Um, if you're doing that and you're also limiting the amount you're training and running as well. So your team training, obviously you don't, you don't have a say in that. You need to do that to improve technically. But if you're a player that has pretty good stamina, but definitely needs to put weight on to excel in their position and at the level they're playing that, then maybe extra stamina work isn't the best idea for you um, because you're going to be burning lots of calories during that session. Um, 
And it also means that you're not really working on your weaknesses and your weakness might be that you're a little bit lightweight and you need to get a little bit bigger. So definitely make sure you're eating enough. Definitely make sure you're not doing too much work outside of your regular team training in terms of running. Um, and definitely make sure you're training for hypertrophy. So if you're ticking those boxes, it's probably likely that you're going to be able to put on weight. And if you are struggling to put on weight, then you need to just go out and eat more. I think that's everyone's dream um, to go out and be able to eat a lot more food. So you've got my, uh, my recommendation there is probably going to be quite a good one for you. So we've got some more questions coming in as well. Um, got a question coming in from Frank Irwin. So he's asking about warm baths or cold baths for recovery. So this is another one that's been covered in our blog as well in quite um, a lot of detail. I think we've got more than one article actually that looks at different types of um, baths and recovery methods. So in terms of recovery, if you're thinking purely how can I train the next day or how can I play the next day um, with minimal soreness and with maximum performance, then although there's not a huge amount of research to absolutely back up every aspect of it, then you're going to go towards a cold bath or a cold and like contrast baths. So you're going to do hot bath for a minute and you're going to do a cold bath for a minute and you're going to repeat that cycle four or five times. So you generally wouldn't choose a warm bath in, in the situation where you're just looking for recovery. So it's, maybe unlikely that you're going to have access to multiple baths. So if you have to choose one, you're going to go for a cold bath, but it comes with kind of a bit of a disclaimer when it comes to ice baths. So ice baths have consistently shown to reduce perceived muscle soreness. So that means the next day, if, if you have an ice bath after a heavy leg session and a heavy training session the same day, you jump in the ice bath for 10 minutes and it's going to be, um, at kind of the right temperature, so looking at between something like 10 and 15 degrees, um, you're gonna find the next day you're probably gonna feel less sore than if you didn't have that ice bath. Whether your performance is gonna improve the next day has, um, there's been kind of mixed findings on that one. Um, and in terms of physiological markers, so usually um, we can look at creatine kinase, um, which is something that's found in the blood if there's a large amount of muscle breakdown, um, that has actually been shown to be roughly the same after ice baths, um, or if someone didn't have an ice bath, it's roughly the same. So it's kind of more a psychological benefit than it is from a, um, from a purely performance standpoint. Um, where we do need to be cautious in using ice baths is that ice baths have been shown to reduce um, inflammation, and that's not always a good thing. And the reason why that is, is when you train, you're looking to apply a stressor to your body. So if you apply a stressor, you need to then let your body react to that stressor and ideally super compensate and adapt in a way that your body becomes more able to complete the actions that you've, you actually want to get better at. So if you have an ice bath and you actually blunt those stressors, then you're going to be, be blunt in the adaptations as well. So what you'll find is that it depends on the time of the season and what your goals are, whether it's going to be useful or not for you. If, you're, if you've had a huge session today and you've got the Champions League final tomorrow, then an ice bath is probably going to be a good thing to do um, because you need to be ready for the Champions League final. And if your technical coach got excited and you had a huge session to get prepared for that, because obviously you need to be prepared for the Champions League final, then it's probably a good idea to have an ice bath. And that way you might feel a little bit better. You might feel fresh going into the tour, uh, going into that, um, that match. Whereas if you're on the first day of preseason where your only goal really is not to win matches on that day or the next day. And even if you've got preseason games, you're probably not that concerned with the result of it. It's more about preparing yourself for the full season. Um, and you've just applied um, a lot of training that you haven't been doing before, then there's probably not much point using an ice bath in this situation because what you'll find is that you've done a lot of work. Now you need to rest and let your body adapt and recover and you might be blunt in that. So there's not much point working hard for something to happen and then potentially stopping it happen to the same extent. So ice baths are probably going to be chosen over anything else. If you only have one bath, um, ice baths and hot baths can be used in conjunction with each other. Um, warm baths are probably for 
a rainy day and relaxing if you need to and that's something you like to do. So yeah, if you want a little bit more detail, um, get on the blog and just Google ice, uh, sorry, Google, um, just search ice baths on the blog and the articles will pop up and you can get a little bit more detail on that. Okay. But yeah, a lot of it's going to be what you can do because obviously if you don't have a bath, there's probably not much time looking at ice baths, but they can be useful in different situations. So Brett is just asking a nutrition question. So definitely tune in when we have a nutrition live. So we had one of those yesterday um, and you'll be able to get that answered in a little bit more detail. Okay, so I've got a, a kind of a, spe uh, a specific question for a position. So we've got um, someone asking what workout and drills um, for a center back, what drills would you use? And is being faster better than stronger? So the, the first thing I would say is why do you have to be either faster or stronger? Is there kind of a big distinction? Is there a continuum where you have strong and you have fast um, for a footballer? Because you don't have to be an Olympic sprinter and you don't have to be as strong as a powerlifter, then you can probably bring those two things together and potentially you can be as strong as you can and as fast as you can while still remembering you're a footballer. So definitely I wouldn't neglect anything like strength because it's going to be really important for performance and it's going to be really important um, from an injury prevention perspective. Um, if strength training has been shown to reduce overuse injuries by more than 50%, so you wouldn't want to miss out on strength training um, to try and spend your time being fast. Um, being fast is obviously really crucial to performance in football. If you're a centre back, then potentially you need to be as fast or even faster, ideally, than the strikers you're playing against. So you definitely, definitely need to make sure you're training for both strength and speed. Um, those qualities are not exclusive of each other. Um, if you do want to look at the extremes and you want to go and look at elite sprinters, you'll find that in the gym they're probably going to be very, very strong in certain movements. Um, so definitely try and do both. Um, they're both really important. I'm not going to say one's one's um, better than the other or one's more important than the other. So Yazzi is asking, how does he grow um, strong and big legs for football? So let's do big and strong. Um, big first is probably easier. So really simple, pick compound movements, um, pick movements that some are quad dominant and some are more hip dominant. Um, train multiple times a week and you want to train first probably for hypertrophy and then probably for strength after that so depending on your training age you might train for hypertrophy anywhere from four to twelve weeks and um, someone with a higher training age might need to train um, a little bit less to achieve hypertrophy someone who has just gone in the gym might need to actually do um, do more than that as well um, up to 12 weeks for hypertrophy and then you can train for strength so make sure your strength session your um, resistance training sessions are varied you don't want to train with just double leg exercises you don't want to train just single leg exercises um, you don't want to just have knee flexion or knee extension exercises make sure your sessions are varied um, definitely look for hypertrophy look to increase muscle size um, and then after that you can probably go out and train for strength and you can probably be stronger um, due to the fact that you've got increased muscular size. And then you can basically stack those two training blocks on top of each other and be better than if you did them the other way around. So yeah, definitely compound movements, lots and lots of sets during your hypertrophy of eight to 15. You're probably gonna get lots of soreness, so definitely do it um, either in your off season or in your preseason. And then you can train more strength as you come towards the season and potentially even during the season as well. Okay, so can I um, jump rope in the beginning of a gym session um, and as a plyometric exercise? Um, so skipping or jumping rope is a great low-level plyometric exercise. Um, it's a good one because as a player or as an athlete, you probably don't think about it that much. But to be successful and be good at skipping, you're going to need to have good rhythm. You're going to need to be reactive, which means being quick off the floor. You're going to need to have a good body posture, which is something that's often overlooked and is really, really important in both plyometric exercise and in sprinting performance. So 
skipping or jumping rope is great either before or after the dynamic warm up. Um, if you're looking at power production for skipping, then I probably wouldn't skip for 30 minutes. I'd probably keep it short, whether it's going to be 20 or 30 second sets or whether you're going to pick a certain number, whether it's going to be um, 20 reps or 30 reps. And then what you can do is just try and look for a little bit more height in between your, in between each rep, we'll call it. So definitely skipping is a great idea. And one of the good things about skipping is that it's appropriate for pretty much any age group. So your under nines can skip. And if you're a, um, a professional footballer, then you can definitely skip as well. And they're probably going to be very useful for both of those groups, which is good. So yeah, skipping is a good one. Okay, so we've got a question that's coming in about stretching before training. So I'll grab some water and then I'll get to that one. So should I stretch before training? Um, the short answer is probably no. So stretching in terms of static stretching has been found to reduce at power output for at least a couple of hours. Um, there might be a case in some situations for stretching before training. If you've had a seven hour drive to training for whatever reason, if you live very far away and you might be stuck on a bus, you might find that certain areas like your hip flexors get really, really tight and you might not be able to perform very well if you don't stretch that muscle group. So potentially dynamic stretching could be used there. Dynamic stretching is something that's always going to happen ideally before training and games, but potentially it might not have the same effect on the muscle length um, as static stretching. So I would only say that you should statically stretch before training if you absolutely need to. Um, even then, there's probably a better alternative or an alternative at least that you could do dynamically, which isn't going to reduce isn't going to reduce your power output in the same way. So want to make sure that we're not making you a worse player, even if it's by a percent or two percent or three percent, um, by doing something like stretching. So if you've got a game at night and you want to stretch in the morning, then feel free. It's probably not going to have much impact. Um, if you feel like you really need to and you're not going to be able to play at all without stretching, then again, do it. But if it's something you can avoid and it's just a, cho a choice between something that's a dynamic stretch and something that's a static stretch, so whether that's like a lunge um, against or versus a hip flexor stretch and you've got a choice, then definitely go for the, for the lunge, something that's more dynamic and probably isn't going to cause that kind of reduction in power output. So yeah, definitely more dynamic always wins pretty much. Okay, got a question. How many times a week should you train legs in the gym? So again, it depends how much training and how much games you have per week in the gym. Uh, I'm going to take this one. Um, oh, it was in pre-season. Okay, so pre-season gives you a bit more flexibility. So two to three times a week is probably an appropriate time to do lower body work. So that doesn't mean that you're going to be pounding away in the gym for an hour and a half or two hours purely on your lower body, but you could definitely do some lower body strength work two or three times a week in the gym and not affect your training too much. Um, that could be something as simple as a trap bar deadlift and a single leg squat at the start of one, one session. And on another day, it could be a split squat or a lunge. Um, as well as some glute bridges and then you'd go on to train some upper body and things like that so as a footballer you're probably not thinking about okay i'm training legs today and um, you might have more of a lower body focus session um but yeah the way that most footballers are probably going to train you're not going to be purely training legs the whole time so with that being the case then two to three times a week is probably appropriate and going to benefit you without taking away from your football training if you're thinking about training the legs as in 20 or 30 sets of eight to 15 reps, then you probably can't do that even once a week is probably going to be too much. So yeah, two to three, three times a week, as long as it's reasonable and fits in with the rest of your, um, fits in with the rest of your program. Okay. Here's an interesting question and it's not purely a strength and conditioning um, question. This says my coach makes us run and lift weights more than playing football. What should I do? Well, if he's your strength and conditioning coach, then um, there's probably not much you can do uh, as that's what he his job is or her job is to uh, to do in that period of time. Um, 
but yeah, definitely, definitely speak to your coach, I would say. The reason I answered this one is because it's a bit of an interesting one. So usually it's completely the other way around in that the football coaches don't want the strength and conditioning coaches to do too much work and they want to concentrate on the technical much more. It's quite interesting that it is this way around. Definitely speak to your coach, find out what the rationale is behind behind what they're saying. But yeah, that's an interesting one as well. Okay. So I mentioned trap bar deadlifts or squats and questions come in asking if those are good exercises to do in season. You could definitely do trap bar deadlifts or front or back squats in season. Um, I would say that trap bar deadlift is probably more appropriate in season due to the fact that it's there's less range of motion. So it's likely going to give you the ability to lift a little bit more weight. Um, and also there's not an eccentric component to it if you want to drop the bar from the top position. So with a deadlift, there's only a uh, concentric component. So once you've stood up, you can drop the bar if you've got the appropriate floor in. And that way it's really going to minimize and reduce the soreness. So you're going to be able to maintain lower body strength during the season without causing any, if maybe a little bit of soreness. So maybe it's wishful thinking to think there's going to be no soreness at all. But if the, the sets and reps are kept low enough, so anything around three, maybe up to five reps is probably not going to cause too much soreness. So trap bar deadlift, if you've got access to a trap bar, is a really good exercise and, and something you can use in season. Okay, and question coming in from Benjamin. Um, he's asking if cycling has any, any benefits for footballers. So I'm going to treat road cycling and an exercise bike is exactly the same in this one. Um, it probably is going to have a benefit for footballers from an endurance perspective, um, especially if the cycling involves high intensity periods. So if you're on a bike, if that's 15 seconds or 30 seconds, where you're cycling maybe at 8 out of 10 um, RPE, so 8 out of 10 difficulty or more, then it's probably going to have a good impact on a footballer's ability um, to deal with high intensity actions in games because you're going to be training similar energy systems to what is used in crucial moments in games. Um, if you're talking about going out and doing really long, slow um, bike rides, then it's probably not going to have much, um, much impact. But the reason I wanted to answer this one is my point I'm going to make now is that cycling or any conditioning that doesn't involve um, additional load on the joints like running wood is probably going to be a good idea if you're someone who's got any injury issues and anyone who already has a busy training schedule but feels they need to do some more endurance training. So cycling can be really, really useful if it's programmed well, and it's something that can be utilized by healthy and injured athletes as well. So it can be a really useful piece of equipment to have. So we're gonna call the live video there. Um, hopefully I've got through a lot of your questions today. So something just to mention before I sign off, um, if you didn't hear it at the beginning, is that um, Match Fit Conditioner are going to try and introduce some one-to-one -one consultations with various coaches. Um, and this is hopefully going to mean that we can answer some of your more specific questions and help you structure some things that are really individual to kind of your playing situation and your life um, as something that we can't do um, 100% in these live videos or in the Facebook community page if you have bought any of our programs. So these one-to-one -one consultations ideally will make things more specific to your situation and hopefully mean that you can get um, as much as you can out of your training. So thanks for your support as always. Thanks for tuning in. Um, apologies that we struggled a little bit with the, um, with the live in terms of the uh, video quality at the start, but hopefully we got around to enough for you. So thanks everyone and hopefully see you next week. And anyone who tuned in in our Facebook community, thanks a lot. And this video is going to be up on the, uh, the Facebook uh, community. It's not going to be going anywhere. So you, you can tune in and watch any questions a little bit later on. And thanks a lot, guys.